thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to um, sh talk to you about some of the work that the Kerry Light Project has been uh, developing on the woodland side. And I'd like to thank um, Kevin Collins at the Forest Service and Declan Little of Woodlands of Ireland and uh, Philip O'Dea of Quilcha for all their support in, in helping us work through um, the subject. So for, uh, for most of you, I suppose you mightn't be too aware of what the freshwater pearl mussel is. So I'm going to first, uh, or the Kerry Light Project. So I'm going to actually introduce both of those um, to you uh, this, or this afternoon. So the Kerry Light Project is a EU funded life project. Um, it is a partnership project um, we're uh, coordinated by the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gwiltucht, uh, specifically the National Parks and Wildlife uh, section of the, the department. And then we have six partner organisations, the Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, uh, Chagask, Quilcha, South Kerry Development Partnership, a local leader company and also uh, Pobble. Um, it's a f five and a half year project started in July 2014 and it runs till the end of uh, 2019 and uh, it's uh, locally known as Kerry Life. Uh, it's a five million euro budget. So the freshwater pearl mussel itself is a bivalve. It's uh, got a number of conservation uh, threats to it. Um, they include siltation, nutrient uh, enrichment and hydrological uh, changes uh, in the river channel. Um, the species is, uh, I suppose it's an indicator species, it really, really is the canary in the mine in terms of your high status water bodies. Um, if you still have good uh, recruiting populations of mussels, your river is in pretty good condition. Um, however, as I said, it is really sensitive to changes. So the changes such as these, such as siltation, are coming from a uh, multitude of land uses. And it's often quite a diffuse pressure, so it's a cumulative effect. Sorry. Um, so you're also getting uh, nutrient enrichment and some hydrological changes from drainage uh, in the upper catchment, both from forestry and uh, also from agriculture. The Kerry Life Project has specifically for forestry uh, applied a kind of an integrated uh, risk assessment model. Uh, we start by looking at what the sources of sediment and nutrients are. Um, then we look at the pathways and the, uh, the receptor. So for the forestry uh, work, we've been looking at documenting what the current management practices are. So when was the forest uh, uh, planted? How has it been managed since? Has it been thinned? What other interventions have been carried out? Uh, was there ground preparation, so on and so forth at the, at the establishment stage? Also looking at fertilization. That information is put together then with the, the site conditions. So we looked for wet areas on, on, on the site. Um, we looked for the pathways out of the actual forest uh, that might bring your, um, your, your, your source of sediment or nutrient to the actual river. Because remember, if you don't have all three elements to this, you don't necessarily have a risk to the pearl mussel or to your receiving environment. So you need, the source needs to be able to reach um, the, 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 the target receptor. The Kerry Life Project has integrated these two elements, so we try and bring the two together. Um, that's uh, uh, the, the, the core uh, of the approach. And then we have developed a number of measures that we're trying to uh, demonstrate and adapt uh, for um, the sensitivities of uh, the freshwater pearl mussel. All of this information is then compiled into a management plan. Um, so the project is working as, uh, in terms of forestry. We are uh, working with eight quilcha uh, uh, forests uh, in the Cara and Blackwater catchments. And they cover about 485 hectares. And we're also working with uh, two private forests covering about 30 hectares. The reason we focus on the public estate uh, over the private estate in the Kerry Life Project is that the, uh, these uh, uh, forests are older and more mature and, cl and closer to, uh, I suppose, that pinch point for the freshwater pearl mussel when it comes to uh, harvesting. Um, some, of the some of the measures I'm going to talk about uh, that we've trialled uh, include uh, looking at mitigating current practices. So what can we do to, to, to disrupt that connection between your sources of sediment and our nutrients? Uh, along the pathway. 
Uh, so for example, for um, one of our uh, more novel approaches to date has been uh, rather than trying to silt trap in the streams, we're actually putting the silt traps actually on the drive or on the, in the dry. Uh, so we're trying to intercept the sediment as it runs through the, through the, the forest floor and prevent it from reaching um, the water, the main pathways. Once it's in these pathways, it can be very hard to, 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 to uh, uh, intercept it. And so therefore you have a lower uh, chance of uh, success. So, uh, so you can see a before of the same stream and you can see some of the silt uh, curtains that we've uh, uh, put, in, put in to protect uh, the water course. Uh, another uh, aspect of it has been trying to intercept nutrients that are, uh, that are uh, part of the, the, the current uh, management system of uh, using brash mats. So you use the brush to prevent sediment loss, or sorry, uh, to, to, to minimize sediment disturbance uh, and, uh, from the site. And this is, uh, but by doing so, you're leaving all of your nutrients from your, uh, your uh, harvested uh, conifer on site. So we've, uh, this was planted uh, as part of an operation. You have a control on the, on the left, and uh, uh, seven months later, you can see that we're, we're promoting uh, nutrient uptake and also reducing the, the ground exposure. So it's simple measures that are trying to all the while reduce the impact of forestry, uh, of, of, of these uh, um, potentially negative effects. Another nutrient measure has been the removal of um, brash off site. So we'd on one particular site, we had a small two hectare part of the site that was very hydrologically connected. Uh, we didn't feel we could adequately mitigate uh, it in terms of nutrients. So the solution was to see could we actually export the nutrients from that portion of the site as part of a partial solution to the, to the, to the, to the uh, challenge. So the um, material was uh, gathered and uh, brought to a, a, a landing base and then it was uh, chipped and exported to a local riding stable. So this was all done with all the relevant uh, uh, permissions and uh, uh, licenses, although you, you don't need too, mi too many of them as it turns out. But we, we were conscious of where we were actually moving the, the brash to, so we weren't just moving the problem outside of the, the catchment. So about 200 uh, tons were uh, taken from about two hectares of a uh, uh, thing. Other measures that are trying to disrupt uh, kind of the, that pathway uh, include uh, replicating natural hydrology, uh, natural little barriers on the forest floor. So on the on the uh, on the right, you can see that there's a natural um, uh, image, and you, uh, this is a measure then that has been put in by Kerry Life to re replicate that uh, uh, approach. Other measures include drain spilling. Uh, so we're trying to take water out of uh, a, a channel and diffu uh, spread it diffusely into a uh, existing buffer area, um, all the way, all, all the while trying to reduce the the um, amount of sediment that might be able to leave leave, leave the site. Um, in terms of restructuring, one of our early trials uh, has been to uh, use a technique of halo thinning. So uh, Jonathan uh, spoke about it this morning, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with what it is. But you can see a before and after of the same site, um, just two years apart. And it's a way of preferentially um, trying to promote broad leaves um, around a particular site. So you harvest the conifers that are the, around your broad leaf, and you repeat that until you restructure your woodland towards, um, towards a, a, a permanent protective woodland. The main advantage of this is that it's a, it's a phased um, uh, restructuring, and you don't require, in very sensitive locations, you don't have to go in there with large machines uh, or uh, that, that might cause uh, ground disturbance and sediment and nutrient losses. Um, other restructuring techniques that are going to be trialled and looked at and investigated, I suppose, from a permosal point of view, include uh, cabling. Uh, we've also commissioned a heli-logging um, study, first and foremost, to see is it technically practical and what are your costs. We're not saying it will be implemented, but I suppose there's lots of questions of, well, can we do it? And the first and foremost thing is, let's see, is what, what has been uh, done elsewhere. So uh, feasibility study has been, uh, 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 been prepared at the moment and should be uh, due in the next few months. Um, we're also looking at continuous 
covered trials. Um, so we were the, the different various uh, uh, options are available, but you you need particular uh, um, this, your areas can't be uh, very exposed, and these it's quite challenging in a pearl mussel context because, especially west of Ireland, pearl mussel uh, rivers where you have high rainfall and high exposure and peat catchments. Um, we're looking at retrofitting buffer and lastly kind of habitat restoration all the while trying to see can we uh, 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 strike a better balance between how the impact of the water quality or your forestry operations and the receiving uh, environment. Other trials include uh, control burning uh, which is uh, a way an alternative to um, using the grubbing technique where you're trying where you uh, install fire breaks on the perimeter of your uh, forest as part of this trial we're looking at willow uh, and, uh, and and control burning <laughs> so and thanks to Kieran Nugent of the Forest Service for all his support uh, in implementing those trials from a native woodland point of view I suppose we're trying to promote um, the the protective uh, long-term nature of uh, broadleaves through the project. Um, it ha native woodland has a huge number of benefits uh, in our view, uh, for, especially for the freshwater pearl mussel. Uh, these include the reducing diffuse pollution, uh, it's a, uh, an extensification of land use, especially in your riparian zones. Um, it can moderate water quality or water temperature, uh, intercept pollutants, and also it can aid with flood risk and uh, contributes to biodiversity. Um, as far as that, we've, we've trialled a, a couple of different uh, establishment techniques. So one was uh, uh, as part of a, uh, a restock of an existing, um, or, or sorry, pre, uh, second row, um, a clearfell uh, site. We have used a birch uh, seed that was broadcast, broadcast by hand, um, and it's been quite successful to date. We're looking at different deer fencing mechanisms because some of the challenges sometimes can actually be around the economics of your native woodland. So we're looking at uh, using uh, stumps from uh, trees, uh, from your harvested trees to form part of your fence line uh, and seeing if that's effective. Um, but overall, I suppose, with, with one of our experiences to date has been that it has been quite challenging to get landowners to consider um, planting, and I think you know there was a, the, one of the plenary talks this morning touched on the the value that farmers hold of their land. This is you're you're asking, especially in these uh, catchments that we're operating in, to give up maybe some of their best land, um, and they might have very little land. So you're you're asking for a lot even by asking the question. But that said, we've we we've identified lots of opportunities. Um, it was uh, uh, a lot of the sites were fragmented, so small areas. Um, it kind of went back to the, the early part of reps, where they would have uh, set up a small part of a, a field that would have been classified as a habitat, and it might have scrubbed up in time. And it, that that was the, the kind of the, value, the view they had uh, of it. But, but we, uh, and obviously then from to maximize benefit to water quality for the freshwater pearl mussel, we, we were looking at trying to get long linear um, sites as well, so that you maximize your benefit to uh, the, the, the mussel. The project had a target of 40 hectares, and while we identified about 15 or so hectares through the participants, the initial, um, the, this was quite low. So we had to change uh, tack and we organized a very successful um, field visit to a nearby uh, a native woodland a forest site uh, in the gap at Dunlow. And uh, we, invite, we opened it up to the, all landowners within the project area. This identified several new sites and we can, uh, the, our first uh, 11 hectare site has been uh, recently uh, approved and work is uh, about to proceed imminently on that, that application, or I mean actually planting it. Um, and I suppose through this kind of experience we've identified some types of issues where, uh, where I, th I think we can, we can uh, 
contribute very positively to maybe in the f in future cycles of the forest program. So some of them might be that the, the question of uh, these setbacks. Um, so if you have a water course running through your, your land uh, and as part of your application area, it can eat into this 15% that you can uh, allow. So you, you, the farmers that have, or landowners that have a lot of water course uh, and are interested in it can actually be penalized by having that river present because of just the, the way the scheme is currently structured. Um, and it can, it can be the difference between a, a yes or a no for, for the farmers. Um, so I suppose we're looking, we've identified maybe the potential for greater flexibility in some of these areas. The, all of this can contribute very positively to uh, rolling out um, schemes such as were announced this morning, the, the Woodlands for Water Protection. And it's trying to work with the landowners that, and their interest in, in actually doing the right thing, but it has to, has to work as well for them. Um, so I'm, uh, without further ado, I'm going to say thank you very much for your, your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to take it as part of the discussion.